There is no possibility of reverting to the pre-pandemic status quo. The reason for this is simple. It was the status, it was that status quo that produced the pandemic. An increasing likelihood of pandemic was wired into the regime of globalization that developed over the past few decades. But this regime, this regime of free market globalization is already history. What I'd like to do now is to point to three features of that regime, uh, which uh, together, along with some other factors, made the pandemic possible and in the long run, inevitable. The first of these three features is worldwide mobility. The continuous, rapid, systemic mobility of uh, goods, capital, and also, and crucially, human beings. Uh, more than at any time in the past, human beings are uh, not sedentary, they're not limited to a small locality or a particular country. They're traveling everywhere uh, uh, all the time, or at least they were before the pandemic. And that, of course, is facilitated by a feature which wasn't present in the pandemic, the flu influenza pandemic of 100 years ago, um, mass uh, air transportation, um, hugely expanded in the last few decades, wasn't present 100 years ago in the influenza uh, pandemic, but, it, but was a structural feature of the world economy and world society uh, leading up to our present pandemic. And uh, that has uh, been greatly curtailed by the pandemic, and I think uh, will remain reduced. Uh, global mobility of human beings will be on a, uh, a lower scale in the future than it, had, than it was before um, the uh, coronavirus pandemic. The third feature of um, the regime of globalization that broke down uh, with the pandemic is in my, to my mind, possibly the most important, which is the continuous destruction of natural environments by expanding human populations, which removed the habitats, destroyed, desolated the habitats of countless animal species and thereby allowed viruses to jump more easily to humans. It was that uh, continuing process of environmental destruction together with the so-called wet markets in Asia and elsewhere in the world of uh, exotic and rare animal species that made the jumping of viruses, zootic viruses, viruses jumping from other species to humans more and more likely, more and more uh, a bigger and bigger risk and, and which eventually uh, um, was bound to produce one, a pandemic of one kind or another and in fact produced the one we're still uh, uh, going through. And what the virus has shown, together with abruptly accelerating climate change, which is also going on at the same time, I believe now, has, has done is to show this, that this project of a separate human ecosystem, decoupled, detached, insulated from the rest of the planet, is an illusion. That's the deepest meaning of this pandemic. So um, having said that, I'll say a little more about how the, uh, and in what respects, the regime of globalization that existed before the pandemic has broken down. It's already broken down. It's already changed. It's already history, actually. Um, uh, and uh, uh, oh, as I said right at the start, an historical period to which we can't return because it was that period that produced the pandemic. So what's happening? Well, there are various uh, signs of it's uh, morphing into a different kind of system or a set of fragmented systems. Businesses are shortening their supply chains. Governments, for example, out of Japan, are offering incentives to companies to reshore production. In other words, bring them back from remote parts of the world or parts of the world which are politically or in other ways unstable. Strategically important industries, 
are being protected from foreign competition more even than before. Governments everywhere are imposing restrictions on international travel, whether for tourist or business purposes. And maybe this is the biggest change which is underway, a global economic regime based on maximal cost efficiency. That means the cheapest labor and the lowest production costs are what the system prioritized. That's what the system was looking for. It's shifting to one in which governments are trying to make their economies more resilient and more secure. Um, but this isn't a planned move. It's not a move that any of these governments planned. And it's certainly not a move being uh, organized by any international authority. It's just happening and it's already happened. Different states, different sovereign states are adopting policies they believe will enhance the security of their citizens regardless of the impact on the system as a whole. Now this can be dangerous, obviously. It can promote um, geopolitical conflict, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but uh, paradoxically, maybe, a more fragmented world could be more stable, more resilient. If everything's linked up to everything else, if every part of the global economy is tightly enmeshed in a, an enormous system of delicate supply chains and intricate interdependencies, then any disruption to the system will be transmitted everywhere quite quickly, whether it's a pandemic or not, uh, or something else. And the system is actually highly, highly um, uh, fragile. The par one of the paradoxes we have to grasp about the world today is that a less integrated, more fragmented system might in the long run be more stable. We're moving into a world in which virtual mobility may be even more on a greater scale than human mobility was, but it'll also be a low contact human world. And this isn't just a matter of cutting back on business travel or the rise of online retail, uh, which have obviously occurred. Education, personal relationships, um, community life in churches and uh, neighborhoods um, uh, and city life will all be more virtual, I think, than they have been in the past. Of course, they can't be completely virtual because human beings haven't evolved to be to live entirely in a virtual environment and ways of uh, 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 interacting with each other while preserving social distancing for as long as it's needed, which I think could be a long time, in some forms maybe indefinitely, will have to be devised. But the background have to be worked out. Um, um, uh, we can't live uh, uh, decoupled from human beings, families, sexual and love relationships, and some forms of face-to-face -face community are essential for human beings. So we have to find them. Nevertheless, human beings, I think, are going to live virtually in virtual space more than they've ever done before. This, of course, will have enormous economic uh, implications and consequences and costs. Many industries are destined to shrink or even disappear. Uh, propping up airlines, I think, is futile. Um, airline, we'll need airlines, they'll still need to be international air transportation, but on nothing like the scale before. Even uh, uh, railways in this country, our present government is um, uh, committed to a vast expansion of rail travel from London to the north of um, Britain. Uh, I think the wisdom of that is very doubtful, apart from its environmental costs and its enormous financial costs, 100 billion or more, it's now estimated. I think working at home will be much more common in future than it has been, partly from necessity, but partly because many people prefer it. Uh, many people op will opt for working at home rather than tiresome, exhausting, expensive commutes especially if a risk of infection continues to exist, even if um, uh, the virus has been um, beaten back in many ways. As long as there is a significant risk of infection, then um, 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 people may prefer to work at home, either completely or at least to travel less uh, than they've done before uh, to work, to go in for two or three days a week or not at all, 
rather than make these uh, daily commutes. So we're finding in Britain a tremendous impact on coffee shops. Coffee shops were kind of um, uh, dependent, reliant on um, the, the, uh, the so-called Pret economy was created by commuting. If commuting is going to be, as I believe it will be, at a much lower level than it's been in the past in Britain and other countries, including the countries of Latin America, then those parts of the economy were are just bound to shrink. Uh, I think universities, as they currently operate and, and are constituted, will actually um, shrink and many of them will cease to exist because the kind of face-to-face uh, -face interaction um, that they're based on um, uh, and which, they, which students pay for and which students go into debt to finance will not be worth it. If so much of university teaching goes online, as is in fact happening, it will not, it'll be a bad bargain. Humans won't want it. Uh, many students won't want it. They won't be prepared to pay those kinds of uh, fees. And this brings out a kind of quite important point. We shouldn't all, we shouldn't uh, think that the costs of, of the large changes and the costs of the virus come solely from governments, perhaps from the incompetent policies of governments. They do partly. No government has really responded to this in any way that could be described as perfect, certainly not. And they've all made mistakes, I think. But part of the costs, part of the changes, a large part, comes from people themselves, come from below, come from large human populations. They just don't want, for example, to engage in the tiring, exhausting uh, daily commute, five days a week, uh, uh, that they did before. They've learned from the um, uh, lockdowns, uh, 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 which were instituted in many countries against the uh, uh, to protect against the pandemic, that they don't want to live like this again, and they won't go back. Governments won't be able to force them, I don't think. Um, or if they do force them, which may be happening in China, it won't be popular, and it, and it won't perhaps be uh, all that uh, efficient either. Um, other phenomena that will develop will be uh, no doubt partly good and partly bad. Robotization in factories will accelerate and the robotization even of human services, social services, like caring for very old people. I think that will advance too. Uh, and that they pose lots of dilemmas, but I think that's what will happen. So the resulting social and economic impact will be large and enduring. It won't, um, certain trends that were advancing anyway towards robotization, towards a more virtual form of mobility, have been hugely accelerated. Changes that would have taken five or more years have occurred in five or more months, and they won't be unraveled, they won't be reversed. Governments in many countries want to reverse them, are trying to reverse many of them, but they're going against the grain. They're going against the grain of the fact that although many people dislike and resist the limits on their leisure, we lockdowns entail, at the same time, they don't want to go back to the life uh, of commuting and intensive uh, mobility that existed before um, the, the lockdown. And in this process of adjustment and adaptation, many governments, many political systems, I think will fall um, because they're just not capable of uh, dealing with it, um, of dealing with the adjustments that are required. But as I said from the start and more than once throughout this, um, these, these, these thoughts, this talk, Free market capitalism, really, of the kind, the, the global kind that existed before, is it's really already history. It's gone. Governments have uh, a much deeper interaction, a much deeper uh, um, involvement in the economy than under that model, which was always partly an illusion, of course. But, uh, but at the same time, I think central planning isn't uh, a, a, a viable option either. Um, it's too far away from... Uh, local concerns, local communities. Um, it's, it, it, it's too much one size fits all and the plans that are developed are invariably uh, defective. What I think the future lies with is hybrid regimes that mix uh, um, uh, free markets and, and uh, various types of government intervention and planning using new technologies to adjust to a situation in which the old world no longer exists. So 
in conclusion, if we want to make the post-pandemic world humanly habitable, we have to accept that there's no going back to the world that existed before the pandemic. It's gone forever. Um, we're living in a time of an almost perfect storm. The burning forests in the Amazon, in Oregon and Australia, and the melting polar, polar glaciers are interacting with the pandemic to really alter the world from which it's, the forms in which it's been, even in my lifetime and in the lifetime of anyone that uh, now uh, lives. So the earlier project of constructing a separate um, ecosystem, a separate ecoculture, one which is decoupled and insulated from uh, uh, the rest of the planet, that's failed definitively. Uh, we have to learn to live uh, in a world in which the human bubble, the bubble that we tried to create, has burst. We have to find ways, um, different ways in different societies, in different communities, to live in this new world uh, that has now come into being. Thank you.